Okay, well, depending upon your psychological and philosophical preconceived prejudices, you may be wanting or have been waiting for this moment or dreading it. Uh, Juan Maldacida is going to tell us about his thoughts on the wave function of the universe. Well, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to speculate. It's always nice to speculate about time and so on. So probably most of what I'm going to say is wrong, but I'll try to put some correct things uh, in it. So M M theory or string theory is a theory of quantum gravity, so it will contain a wave function. So let's call that the wave function of the universe. And so the question is, what do we know about it? What, what do we know about this wave function? Um, now, there are some things we know about it in, for example, the context of ADS-EFT. So there we have a quantum theory on the right-hand side here. We have a conformal field theory. That conformal field theory has a wave function. It's defined here on the boundary. Now, on the gravity side, we don't know what the equivalent concept is, but uh, presumably there is a similar concept. And semi-classically, that wave function is the uh, standard wheeler the width wave function, which will depend on spatial cross-sections of the metric and all the other fields. Um, of course, uh, that wave function is a function of, the, uh, of all spatial cross-sections. And in some sense, it's describing everything that is happening in uh, in the region here, inside this wedge, because all these are uh, space-like cross-sections of the metric, and uh, the wave function tells us what the amplitude is for encountering these uh, different metrics, and the wave function depends on these metrics through some oscillatory phase that tells us that we should patch in all these metrics in precisely this way, okay? Let's us reconstruct that geometry. Uh, that's uh, the semi-classical picture. And so, of course, uh, you all know that uh, the wheeler the witt Hamiltonian in the bulk is zero, and um, that, uh, well, I shall say that we have this uh, semi-classical expansion where, uh, as a function of the overall scale, the wave function oscillates very fast, and we can then think of the wave functions of the rest of the variables and choose uh, the scale factor A as time, basically. Um, now, the Hilbert space in this context is just the Hilbert space of the boundary theory, of the boundary conformal field theory. And if we have several boundaries, we uh, have um, several copies of the Hilbert space. And so basically what happens is that uh, the, uh, this Hamiltonian, which is zero in the bulk, is non-zero in the boundary. And the, uh, it's the Hamiltonian of the field theory uh, on the boundary. Um, now here, if we have many boundaries, we have many times, and correspondingly, uh, this wave function, so we can define a wave function on this product of Hilbert spaces, and in principle, that wave function is supposedly uh, describing whatever happens uh, inside this region. So it's encoding the geometry and all the physics of those slices in, in, in that region. Notice that this uh, touch here, the black hole singularity, and so presumably understanding better these wave functions in the conformal field theory, we should be able to extract what's going on here and what happens there. And so, I mean, we don't know exactly how to describe this, but I don't think it's a very unreasonable goal to try to understand this better in the, in the field theory so as to uh, finally be able to understand that. Um, so um, we would like to understand that, and in the process of understanding that, we'll have to really be able to understand how local measurements are done in here in the interior, and we'll have to f probably face some of all these problems. An observer who is doing some measurement here is part of the system, and uh, so quantum mechanics of closed systems, and how time appears, and all these uh, dreaded problems that, uh, on which it's very hard to do progress, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to make some progress. Um, now, you probably all know some curious features associated uh, to, well, I guess, quantum gravity and so on. So now, w one of the interesting facts is, I think, that the Hilbert space is really associated to the boundaries. So there is, there is little evidence that we have a Hilbert space in the interior, and we seem to have a Hilbert space only when we insert the boundary. Um, of course, well, we, this is something we all expected, that we have dynamical evolution in these Hilbert spaces only when uh, 
thanks to the fact that we have the boundary and we have the boundary conditions that determine what the Hamiltonian is. And so this evolution in this Hilbert space is set, and what the operators are and so on, is set by the infrared boundary conditions in the bulk. So in some sense, the, um, we really need this infrared, some kind of infrared asymptotics. We need a space that is infinite. Uh, well, here I was discussing the case of ADS space, but of course the case of flat space is very similar. So we need this, uh, uh, this perfectly ADS or per essentially perfectly uh, flat space in order to be able to precisely define mathematical quantities. And we really don't know how to do things otherwise. And it would be very nice to understand how to do things otherwise, of course. Um, now, um, this it was pointed out, especially by Ed, that this is very similar to what happens in Chern Simons theory. We have a topological theory. Uh, when we introduce boundaries, we have a boundary system with a boundary Hamiltonian with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, typically on the boundary. Of course, the boundary is in time. The number of degrees of freedom is fine. Um, now, that's uh, the wave function in this Lorentzian picture. Uh, there is a corresponding, uh, you can similarly think about the wave function in Euclidean quantum gravity. Uh, the traditional philosophy is that um, the wave function of the universe will be oscillatory in some regions uh, and uh, exponentially decaying in some other regions. And so when we do Euclidean quantum gravity, we compute the uh, wave function of the universe in these uh, exponentially small regions. Of course, this is a point emphasized by Hartle and Hawking um, when they computed the wave function of the universe. And what they said was that computing the wave function in this uh, Euclidean region might probably determine the wave function in the Lorentzian region. But anyway, so we have a prescription for how to compute this wave function, uh, at least when uh, the geometries are very, very big. So we have a prescription for computing this exponential taste of the wave function, and the prescription is uh, this prescription given by Gavser, Polyakov, Klevanov, and Witten, where you equate the wave function of the universe on uh, this uh, spatial slide, on, well, for a metric that is getting very, very large, the wave function of the universe is very, very tiny, so there is a very tiny exponential tail, but the prefactor is a prefactor that is given by the partition function of the conformal field theory on that geometry, of regularized with some, uh, with some regulator. And so this wave function is in principle, so you can compute it, and uh, here in the field theory we'll get a universal answer independent of the regulator for length scales that are much, more, much bigger than epsilon. So we'll be able, to, through this prescription, to compute the, fix this very large metric and then look at fluctuations around this metric with very lengths much longer than epsilon. Um, so we know a lot about, the conclusion is that we know a lot about very improbable configurations in the universe. Would be very nice to know a little more about the more probable ones. <laughs> um, so, well, many things can be said, like the wheeler the wheat equation is related to the Archie flow equation, and, um, and so on. So, now, I guess, uh, the more probable configurations of the wave functions are the configurations where uh, the wave function is oscillating. So that um, happens in, idea, in DS, in the sitter space. And here also one could try to basically repeat exactly the same picture that we had for this. Uh, essentially, this, exactly the same picture here. So if we say, well, if for highly for the tails, uh, these exponential tails, we had this conformal field theory. Maybe for these rapidly oscillating pieces, we uh, also um, can write a similar formula. I, I forgot here to multiply this by the highly oscillating factor as a function of one over epsilon to some power. Um, and again, the prefactor will be given by this conformal field theory with some cutoff, and that computes the wave function for certain, for the for a big geometry, okay? Um, and so one uh, particular system that we can study uh, or think about it this way is the early universe where we had approximately the sitter, the end of inflation, and well here we had the beginning of the inflation, that's an approximately the sitter, fa the sitter space. And uh, when we look at primordial fluctuations where essentially what we are essentially doing is measuring this psi um, at the end of inflation. So 
this the Sitter evolution will produce for us a wave function through essentially the Hartle-Hawking prescription. And here, uh, at the end of the universe, this, uh, the rest of the evolution of the universe is like a measurement apparatus that measures uh, what the distribution of primordial fluctuations was. And then when we now look at the photons and so on, we uh, deduce what they, were, what they were. And the standard inflationary theory so it tells us how to compute that wave function. Um, so in that sense, we uh, are meta-observers of this early universe. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion about meta observers don't exist and so on, but in this uh, sense, met we are definitely meta observers for the early universe if we view that as some kind of regularized uh, BSEFT. Um, well, I'm not sure if I put these transparencies. Well, these are the only transparencies a little more recent. No? Um, so I, I remind you how that goes. So the, what we really want to compute is we have the metric. It's a very big factor times a little scalar fluctuation and tensor fluctuations. And we inflationary, so you can easily compute in the semi-classical approximation that these uh, are the two expectation values for the uh, two-point functions on this, of these uh, operators. Um, so here, uh, the two-point function, for example, of the graviton is proportional to this. This is 1 over C, the central charge of the DSCFT. Uh, and these are pieces enhanced through this uh, slow roll factor. Now, I just li like to link these two formulas to the maybe more familiar formulas for correlation functions of operators in the conformal field theory. Um, this has also been discussed by many people. Um, and so the scalar fluctuations is the correlation functions of the trace of the energy momentum tensor. In a conformal field theory, this would vanish. Uh, and the traceless part of the two-point function is essentially um, proportional to the central charge. Now. Um, so here we have 1 over C, here we have C, and the difference between the two, uh, the two, relations are, the two equations are related by essentially integration. This is, this is telling us what the coefficient of the uh, Gaussian uh, part of the uh, wave function is, and so when we integrate it, we get the result, which is 1 over that coefficient, and that's why we get 1 over C. So this is telling us that uh, if the two-point function of the trace is very, very small, as we expect in a nearly conformal theory, the two-point functions of the scalar fluctuations would be very large. Anyway, uh, this is very elementary. So one question one can ask is, well, of course, uh, this, this gives us some Gaussian wave function. Now, what are the leading order non-Gaussian features? Of course, in GR is an interacting theory. There will be some leading order corrections, some interactions that come from, will come from this uh, three. So we expand the Einstein theory. We will get some interactions. Um, and this is an effect which, relative to the linear effect, is an effect of order h over m uh, in spirit similar. So it's an effect of the same order that, uh, for example, Steve Schenker was this. Well, Steve Schenker would um, discuss effect of order h over m squared. But this is an effect of order h over m that uh, would be present. And so if you do this little calculation, uh, you find, well, indeed, that this is an effect of this order. But then there are some powers of the slow roll parameter which are unfortunately make it uh, unmeasurable in, uh, when uh, you take into account the constraints of cosmic variance. So this, this constraint of cosmic variance is rather annoying, so it would be nice to have very many universes, of course. Uh, but maybe it might be telling us something interesting. Um, well, this computation was done by many, uh, many people. Uh, it's a simple computation. Well, it's in principle philosophically simple, but a little messy when you try to do it. And so different authors obtain different answers. Uh, uh, and since it was too small, nobody really bothered to compute it very carefully. Um, now, one of the interesting questions is whether the number of states in the Sitter space is finite. So, um, now of course, this number of states is the number of states. Sometimes people like to call this uh, number of qubits uh, proportional to s. Now there is, suppose that uh, Tom Banks didn't exist, so <laughs> then we would, uh, <laughs> then we would uh, say that this entropy is uh, the number of states that an observer can measure, and that this entropy is measuring the entanglement between the Hilbert space that the observer uh, inside ADS can measure, and the Hilbert space for all the other observers. Okay? Um, now there is a more radical interpretation. Um, um, 
which says that this number of states is the Hilbert space in terms of which we can express any physical measurement in the Sitter space. Um, and the early universe, S, is uh, bigger than 10 to the 12. So um, if certainly this, this holds for the Sitter space, it should hold for regularize the Sitter space, so where you compute the wave function of the universe in the Sitter space. So let's... Um, So an estimate of uh, the entropy, so the entropy is bigger than this, so if the slow roll parameter, this is the biggest the slow roll parameter can be, uh, but if it's smaller than that, the entropy, of course, will be larger. Um, and so if you do a little calculation, this is an amusing calculation, of, uh, you compute the number of modes that would be, for example, relevant for structure formation. Um, well, that roughly, let's say, is the order of magnitude of the number of galaxies that you have, so at each position of each galaxy, you have to say whether the uh, metrics a little bigger or a little smaller uh, than the background constant metric, and that gives a number of roughly the same order of magnitude. Now, of course, the standard inflationary calculation, you could use it for length scales even smaller than that, so it's predicting the uh, like gravitational waves that will be observed in Neptune's observatory uh, will be length scales much more than that, and LIGO, well, LIGO will not measure that, but at least if constructed, could measure primordial gravitational waves and would be of length scales even smaller than that. So standard inflationary theory is predicting um, is treating as independent a huge number of modes, uh, which uh, in the radical interpretation should not be independent. Um, so I guess the question is how big is this meta observer's Hilbert space? And uh, it seems, it seems to, to be very big. Now, um, if you think that each uh, galaxy is determined by measuring one independent qubit, so it's certainly uh, we have to say whether the inflaton there is bigger or smaller, you definitely get the number of qubits bigger than uh, the entropy. Of course, this could not be independent qubits, and, but since we have only one universe, it's hard to, to tell the difference. Well, at least I couldn't come up with a sharp question. Uh, hopefully, some of you could, can. Um, so even, I mean, cosmic variance is a big limitation, so it's even hard to measure the first departure from Gaussianity. So if you want to test these kinds of ideas, it would be very hard. Now, I would like to contrast what we measure when we do inflation with what we measure from a, an evaporating black hole on which some of these ideas of finite Hilbert space and so on were inspired. So when we have an evaporating black hole and we measure the radiation coming out, we typically measure a further S quanta. I mean, each quantum carries a an energy of order the temperature. And so to get all the mass out, you have a further S quanta. So that's um, rather different. So here we are, in some sense, measuring many more. Now, since uh, the analogy between the sitter and black holes is usually used to uh, argue that the number of, that the Hilbert space is finite, I'll try to use the same analogy to argue that uh, it's actually infinite. Okay, so the idea is to use the analogy not to a single, copy, a single black hole, but to the eternal black hole, where you have two independent Hilbert spaces, and think of those two sides of the black hole as these two observers in the sitter space, which will have... Um, these two independent Hilbert spaces. So now we don't have one, but we have two. And well, presumably iterating this kind of argument, we could have many. In the sense, uh, this kind of argument will lead you to believe that, well, you have per Haber volume uh, in, at very late time, you have uh, dimension S, well, E to the S Hilbert space. Um, well, I don't know, it would be very nice to have a concrete example where we could answer these questions. Um, Another question that uh, is always puzzling uh, when you think about these things is uh, whether wormholes exist and what their implication is. Now, several people have tried to find wormhole solutions in uh, string theory. I think I, I'm aware of these papers. There are probably many more. Um, I'm, I'm, as far as I know, there isn't uh, any solution in flat space that connects uh, two regions like that. Um, now, um, one could ask the same question in ADS. Can we have an ADS space which uh, is connected by some neck like this? And what would be the interpretation of that space? Now, Witten and Yao show that this cannot be done uh, if the boundaries have positive curvature with uh, solving the usual Einstein equations. And now, and that's the way, so this, uh, 
Um, the idea would be that then if the for usual n equal to Fourier mills, if the curvature is negative, then the conformal coupling of the scalars would imply that they all have negative mass and the theory would not be stable. So we would think, OK, so we cannot uh, have this with positive curvature. And if we had negative curvatures here on the boundary, then the theory wouldn't be well defined and well, uh, we wouldn't know what we are talking about. However, in uh, ADS3 uh, and its relation to two dimensional conformal field theory, we do, uh, we, there, negative curvature is not a problem. And we can put the two dimensional conformal field theory uh, on, some Riemann's, on a Riemann surface. And then it's very easy to construct this kind of uh, wormhole space times. Um, this particular one will, will not have this sort of spherical symmetry, but the idea is very similar. So you have two asymptotic regions. This, this is the metric. Um, and so the question is, how should we interpret this? So here we have, again, the Euclidean wave function of the universe evaluated on two disconnected geometries. Now, what is this telling us? Um, is that the product of two independent conformal field theories? So this seems to be. Uh, this equation seems to be funny because uh, if you, on the gravity side, there seems to be correlations between the two sides, while uh, in the field theory side, it's hard to understand where these correlations would come from. Um, now, I think there are two possibilities. Uh, so one is that maybe in the field theory, we have to sum over sectors, like or formal blocks or something like that. Um, and that will relate it to field theories, but it's hard to understand why this should be so. Uh, um, Another possibility is to say, well, maybe when we sum over all possible geometries that connect them, actually we'll get a result that factorizes. Um, this, uh, well, I, I don't know how this can happen in the particular examples we've looked at. Um, now, this, this property looks a little reminiscent to uh, the, what Hiroshi was talking about for the, these topological <laughs> string amplitudes where they wanted only contributions from the disk, but not anything else. Uh, well. Um, um, and well, there might be some other reasons. So I made some, some argument that the field theory should be well defined, but maybe it's not. So I don't know. Um, now, of course, uh, many people have remarked the similarity of those kinds of space. Well, there's a very similar situation in the sitter space. So we have this connection between the two sides. Now, notice that uh, for the SEFT, it's not terribly important to understand to understand this connection. So I think the cracks of the matter in understanding the SCFT would be to understand the, what happens at very late times. And then this might be, uh, well, once we understand the Euclidean case, we might be able to understand this case too. And because in the far future, we, if we compute quantities at length scales much more than the radius of S3 at, uh, here, here the radius of S3 is growing exponentially. So if we compute the length scales much more than that, uh, we, um, we don't care what happened here in the past, whether we had any past. But we do, of course, care about the fact that we started with something that is somewhat non-singular. So that's what sets the vacuum. Um, and so that essentially is what Hartland and Hawking gave a nice prescription, which is to glue in here the Euclidean vacuum. And the nice feature of this prescription is that this is not, well, this gives us if we have a field theory in ADS, we could even, so a field theory in this De Sitter space, we could even compute corrections and um, field theory corrections, and those corrections are well defined and so on. Because when we, you, you do perturbation theory, you need a definition of the vacuum, and this gives a definition of the vacuum. Uh, now, with this other alpha vacua, I, I'm not sure how to give a definition that would hold also in the interacting theory. Um, now, when you think about how you do calculations here, uh, you realize that what you are doing is you are setting your, vacu your vacuum here at equal to zero. So in some sense, the, uh, when you do perturbation theory here, the arrow of time here is going in this direction, and here is going in this direction. Um, OK, so now uh, I come to probably the most speculative part of this, if this wasn't enough. Um, <laughs> So I, li I like to try to understand what uh, unitarity of black hole evaporation would mean for the singularity. So the fact that the black, hole, that the black holes eva evaporate unitarily, what does it mean for how we deal with this singularity? So there is a standard picture, picture here, uh, which is the one developed by Hawking, which is that you, um, you have uh, 
the Hilbert space, let's say, that describes this matter that falls in. Uh, and then there is, uh, let's say, a scalar field, which is the one in which we cocoon radiation gets emitted. Let's say scalar field and the gravity and so on. Um, for simplicity, I have separated these two, but, well, this need not to be se separated. But, um, and this uh, scalar field can be quantized on some uh, spatial section here. So we'll have a Hilbert space of states in the interior and a Hilbert space of states in the outside. Okay. And so the vacuum of the field theory uh, here in the far past evolves to an entangled state in these two field theories. So we sum over many states in the out Hilbert space and the in Hilbert space. This is the entangled state in this product of Hilbert spaces. And so then uh, there is a point in the argument where we say that we trace over everything that happens here because we'll not be able to measure it. And at that point is when you get the density matrix and you lose information. Now, how do you avoid tracing over the interior? So one idea is that uh, the Hilbert space in the interior is equal, actually equal to the Hilbert space in the outside, and that these two are two complementary descriptions. Now, this uh, idea might be right, but one of the funny things about it is that in order to derive Hawking radiation, we needed to, uh, to talk about these two Hilbert spaces. We needed to uh, assume that we could uh, evolve this state vacuum into, uh, this, um, into that section. So if we can do that, then we can derive Hawking radiation. So how can you, uh, uh, but that, that, that result is clearly correct, at least to lead in order. So an, an idea that uh, we've, di discussed, we've been discussing with Gary Horowitz is uh, the idea that the state at the future of the interior is actually fixed. So the basic idea here is the following. So if you look at this, you have, uh, you have these sections, right? The, you, are, you are having some evolution, and this is evolving forwards into the future. And the interior of the black hole, in order to have unitarity, essentially should evolve to nothing. But this nothing should be just a single state, okay? There is some kind of nothing state to which things evolve. Um, and so this uh, nothing state, we'll call it some uh, state in the, this, let's say, product of Hilbert spaces, the Hilbert space in the interior of the black hole. And the idea is that we'll have to modify the rules of usual quantum mechanics and to say that the final state, uh, which is the final state in the out Hilbert space, is given by taking the inner product of this state that uh, appears in Hawking's description, this state over here. Uh, we take that, the inner product of that, with this black hole uh, state. And so that would, uh, uh, so more explicitly, we can write this entangled state. And the idea is that this black hole state would be a complicated unitary operator, which relates this infalling Hilbert space and. Uh, this, the space of states in the interior. Um, and so in the end, you, you would get this. This sounds, well, I mean, this is inspired in how we discuss string interactions in string field theory and so on. Um, and so the idea is then, so if we have something like, of course, once we have this complicated unitary operator here, um, if we, if we make a measurement that averages over many final states, we'll get the thermal answer. Uh, but of course, one question you can ask is, well, what about the error of time? If you're putting a bound, final boundary condition, it looks like uh, things will look acosal. Um, um, so, uh, but you need to understand that uh, there are really two length scales involved in this problem. One is that, um, there are localized infalling observers whose size is much smaller than the, whose Compton wavelength is much smaller than the horizon size. And there's Hawking radiation whose Compton wavelength is of the order of the horizon size. And the idea is that the infalling observer doesn't measure the, even the infalling, uh, can't measure the infalling um, radiation. So the idea is that, so you have, so you could have the blue case where uh, you have some infalling matter and then you have here some entangled state, but only some very particular state denoted by these blue lines can be absorbed here. And the fact that only that state can be absorbed, it means that only this particular state is emitted. Now, the idea is that if you throw in something else, um, the, the state, so here a different state will be absorbed, this one which has the blue lines plus these red lines. And so a different state then uh, will be emitted here. Um, 
OK. Now, we are always told, so now that's the, the end of that. I want to make just one final remark. Uh, this is maybe even more crazy than the previous ones. Um, so we are always told that we should focus on what's observable. So for example, a sitter observer can, uh, is supposed to measure only a finite number of states. So we would say, well, this will be, we should think about a wave function that lives in CN, in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. But this, this observer can repeat the measurements. And furthermore, even if he measures this wave function, he will not be able to uh, store the results, or he will not be able to know what this wave function is, uh, because, uh, well, he won't be able to have at his disposal uh, a piece of paper to measure the infinite number of digits that you need to specify a wave function in a continuous space. So uh, maybe one should think that in these finite systems, the wave function actually lives in a discrete space. This also would be a departure of quantum mechanics. Um, well, I hope that by the Neptune string conference, we will know the answer of some of these problems, and we'll at least have shown that maybe everything I said is wrong. But some of us think that um, it's, it is time to really start thinking about these questions, probably uh, not as speculative as this, but more concrete questions, and think about concrete ways of addressing these problems, finding, of course, the, the way to do progress in string theory, as we all know very well, is to find concrete uh, problems and co concrete tools, concrete calculations to do, and develop technology, um, as David was saying yesterday. And for that purpose, we are organizing this ITP Santa Barbara workshop on string cosmology, which will, re will run from August to December. And we really hope that uh, you have some interesting new technology to bring to it so that we can analyze the problem of time in string theory. Thank you. I would, I would also, um, before any other question, I would, I would really like to thank the organizers for this wonderful conference, uh, for uh, the for all the dinners, for all the wine, and <laughs> for the concerts, but of course, most of all, for uh, managing to bring everybody here with no problem and with everything running so smoothly as it has been running. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make one comment that if you want to assume that this radical conjecture doesn't exist, you also have to assume that Willy Fischler doesn't exist. Okay, so. thank you. <laughs> uh, I, on this picture of this unique state inside the black hole, so what happens to me if I happen to fall into the black hole in a state that is orthogonal to that state? Well, the, the idea... It, it, in order for you to be orthogonal, you have to fix yourself and lots of low energy, uh, in, this infalling quanta, the Hill Hawking quanta that are, will fall at distance which is space-like to you, and that will yeah. be impossible for you to arrange. But, that, that's basically the idea. But, uh, okay, there are certainly different things, or different ways, different people who can fall in, et cetera. Sure, so sure. there's information. Sure, so sure. It, it yeah, sure. Like so the idea... State. Okay. So the different people are these different eyes, right? Uh -huh. um, and uh, this, these different epsilons are these low energy states. And the idea is that, um, um, I mean, th this encodes your state as in falling person, um, plus this other uh, stuff, low energy stuff that is not accessible to you. You can decide to fall yourself, but you, it's not practical to set what, what low energy quanta are going to be falling. You, the idea is that you will not be able to set that. So that's just part of the information, because I, certainly I can send in different information that sort of makes it into the singularity in this picture, corresponding the, to the different, you know, whatever well, objects or people I throw in. Right, so, so for example, here you send something in. Mm -hmm. And this, the, the idea is that you have here the blue and the red state in this entangled state, right? But if you throw in the blue state, you necessarily here have to absorb the blue state. And that's why outside you have only the blue state. But if you send the blue and the red state, 
then this entangled state contain, contain both of these states, the sum of the blue and the red, right? Inside and outside. And now only the blue and red can be absorbed, and only the blue and red can be emitted. The, the basic idea was, well, yeah, the basic idea was trying to say that uh, it's not that something weird happens on the horizon, but something weird happens on the singularity. And of course, in order to make this, this idea more precise, one would have to ensure and argue maybe a little more convincingly than I have that uh, if you fix boundary con final boundary conditions, you still have freedom to throw in different things locally. And I mean, this is an idea that was, uh, I mean, it's the, the idea that you fix boundary conditions is not new. Um, I mean, Hartman and Gelman had discussed it for the, as final boundary condition for the universe. And the basic idea there is that uh, this final, it's a final quantum state that is a superposition of many things. And the idea is if you have a, a long time to evolve and some mixing to occur and a complicated dynamics, you uh, will not be able to, uh, well, you, you still have, the entropy can locally increase and it will decrease then later. This might be very well be wrong, but I think it's something to So Steve Schenker from Stanford. I, I wanted to make a couple of comments about uh, observing uh, the, the desider-like radia uh, radiation from inflation that, that you referred to. Uh, let, let's imagine that you're looking directly at the gravitational radiation using one of these futuristic detectors uh, that I've mentioned. Um, I, I don't think you'll have problems with cosmic variance even if you look at these very subtle kinds of non-Gaussian signals, because um, the wavelengths are so small. So it may very well be possible you'll be able to see an h over m to the fourth signal times slow roll parameters. Um, you'll have many other problems uh, from you know, astrophysical backgrounds and all kinds of other stuff. So, but that, uh, you won't have fundamental cosmic variance problems. Uh, the, yeah, the, the other comment I wanted to make is that Matt Kleban and, and Lenny Susskind looked a bit at the kind of question you raised about trying to differentiate between the uh, conservative and the uh, radical banks Fischlerian, Fischlerian uh, proposal. Uh, and and we, we came to some sort of, you know, well, I don't know. The conclusions we came to were these, that we formulated the problem this way, that if you were in the conservative proposal, you would see essentially an uh, impure density matrix of radiation. Of, let's say of gravitational radiation coming out to you because your uh, the entangled uh, reservoir was big. If you were in the uh, pure state where you just had a finite number of degrees of freedom, you would, you would produce just a pure state coming at you. And so that if you imagined you could take, you could compute expectation values of quantum operators because you have many patches and so you'd be able to do an experiment effectively many times, the question was, in computing expectation values of quantum operators, how many experiments would you have to do to differentiate a pure state density matrix from a mixed state density matrix when the state has dimension n, where n is e to the entropy? And, well, we, this is a piece of algebra, and, uh, well, I'm not too good at algebra, and, you know, the answer is certainly not log n, at least I convinced myself over the week. It's probably uh, n or n squared where n is e to the entropy. So if the entropy is 10 to the 10th, we're talking about e to the 10 to the 10th measurements or e to the 10 to the 10th squared, depending on what day it was. So it's a, even on Neptune, where you have lots of free time, this is a, a very leisurely process at best. And, and so um, it, it's gonna be, that will be a very hard thing to do. Now maybe there's some cleverer way. These kinds of questions come up in quantum computing about being able to do fast measurements in quantum mechanics that, uh, that, that do things that superficially seem hard. But, but at least superficially, this is a tricky thing to do. Okay, that, that's the end. That, that's what I was referring to with that when cosmic variance would, would set you. I mean, if you, could repeat, if you could repeat the universe many, many times, you would be really measuring these fluctuations for the galaxies many, many times. But I agree with you that, uh, well, w one way of thinking about how many measurements you need to do is that in a, in a in a, in a, I agree with the estimate of order n, and one reason is that you, you can at most measure uh, n commuting observables. Right. And uh, so, um, but anyhow, that looks impractical. I mean, but looks. It's cosmic variance. Well, if you were able to, uh, the problem is that we probably don't have enough measurements to do on the primordial fluctuations. Uh, yeah, we, we'll we'll discuss it later. But.
thank Holgas.